So what I'd like to start out with is just a little brain warm up so you're ready for all that you're going to hear. Um, let's suppose that you're given the arduous task of figuring out which box of cookies to buy. So here is one of the boxes of cookies. It contains one cookie and it costs $2.25. Okay. Here's another box of cookies, uh, not to scale. This has nine cookies in it and it costs $17.75. And then the last box of cookies, well, it would be higher if my arm were longer. It contains 124 cookies, and it costs $59.89. All right, I'll give you a moment to ponder which box of cookies is the best to buy. Yes? Are they all equivalent cookies? They're the same kind of cookie. <laughs> Good question. Yes? I would buy the because I'm hungry. OK. <laughs> it's a good criterion. The largest because you're hungry. Anybody else have a favorite choice? Yes? I'd buy the one cookie because I'm watching my weight. One cookie because you're watching your weight. OK. Yes? I think it depends highly on how many preservatives are in the cookies and whether they will last. Oh, good question. So let's suppose we actually happen to have a party with uh, 1,116 people. <laughs> so all the cookies are going to get used up, one way or the other. Which kind should you buy? Let's suppose none of them are you, okay? So whether you're hungry or whether you're, we're watching your weight, doesn't matter. Which, which ones would you buy? I've got a tough crowd. Yes? So um, I guess I'm my cry. Is uh, I want to get my best value. Best value, okay. So if you want to get your best value, what would you choose? I can't do those numbers in my head. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, for only one of those, is the number of cookies greater than the number of dollars? So I think that uh, <laughs> I think I can, you know, figure out that level of the mathematics. Okay. So so <laughs> you like this one? This is the kind you want to go for, without doing all the work. So let's learn from that lesson. Very important lesson. This is cookie lesson number one. Make note. Don't do more work than you need to. So in particular, you didn't actually have to calculate the cost per cookie to know that this one was the best. So don't do more work than need. OK, now, if you want to save money, then why wouldn't you just get this box? This is the cheapest box. It can't, well, you'd have to get a lot of them, right? So the other lesson, cookie lesson number two, is that what we're implicitly doing is we're looking at the cost per cookie, the cost per unit. It's not the cost just of a box. So that's our second lesson. We're going to measure cost per unit. OK. Well, I have a bad piece of news for you. These cookies expired in 1992. <laughs> so what can we learn? Are you still interested? They're still, you're still, because they're for other people. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> you have to eat one of them. OK. So, <laughs> so assume you care about the other people. Maybe cost is not all that matters. Okay, so primed with that, let's go back to the knowledge of computer science, which is what we were talking about last time. We were talking about how to create algorithms, write them using pseudocode. And today what we're going to do is figure out how to figure out which algorithm among a choice of algorithms is the best choice. And we're talking about algorithms that all solve the same problem, otherwise it's kind of strange to compare them. So let's think of this as being a representation of a problem. And we have uh, some number of algorithms that we're going to choose among. We're going to assume they're all correct. They all solve the problem. And now we also have to think about the fact that, well, these could be written in any number of programming languages. Let's assume they all can be written in all. And of course, these programming languages are going to be run on some kind of computer.
So it looks like there's a lot to think about when we're thinking about what the best algorithm might be. It could be a lot of different factors. It could be how much you have to pay a programmer to be willing to write that off as code. It could be the amount of memory being used. It could be the running time. We're going to make things simpler. We're not going to do more work than needed. We're going to make things simpler and simpler as we go through. And we're going to make things simpler in this instance by just looking at running time. So that will be our measure of how good something is. So let's think about another real life example, just like your cookie dilemma. Suppose that you wanted to build a house. And you had three sets of plans. One was from, for maybe a one room shack, one was from a bungalow, and one was for a mansion. And I'm going to give you three different options of how you might approach this decision. And you can decide which is the best. So option number one is, to build all three houses, keep track of how much it costs for each one, and then figure out which one is cheapest so you know which one to build. That's option one. Who likes option one? Not very popular. OK, here's option number two. You take the plan for your shack, and you figure out mm, how much the windows are going to cost, and the, the floor covering, and your favorite choice of um, window covering and so on. You're going to figure out all those detailed numbers. You're going to add that all up. And then you're going to look at your bungalow, and you're going to figure out which wallpaper you like, and all the details, figure that all out. And then you're going to go to the mansion, and you're going to figure out for the banister on the staircases what you're going to have, and figure it all out. And then you're going to make a decision. Who likes option number two? What is option number three? <laughs> Option number three is you get a rough idea of the major cost of each of the plans and compare them without worrying about the, worrying about the details. Who likes option three? Oh, good. And you know what fits in really well because we're not supposed to do any more work than needed. Okay? So option one is kind of like trying to figure out which algorithm is best by implementing it in all the programming languages, running it on all the computers, figuring out which ones it was the fastest, and then saying that's the one we're going to go with. That's way too much work. So let's add a little bit of detail to this not doing more work than needed. In particular, we're going to make our calculations without actually building something or implementing something. So we'll say calculation. without implementation. That is one of our goals here. And in order to not do more work than needed, we're going to avoid, we're going to avoid details that we don't need. So we'll avoid details. That are not needed. OK? All right. So now what are we going to do? Well. Since our cookie lessons have been so useful, let's go back to cookie lesson two. In our cookie lesson two, what we want to be doing in figuring out which algorithm is best is we're going to try to figure out what the cost is per unit. And here what the unit is, is or what the way we're measuring unit cost, is with respect to the size of an input. So we're not going to say, oh, this algorithm runs really fast when there's only one input. But this one is much slower on 10 inputs. That doesn't make a lot of sense. We need to even the playing field. So let's talk about the cost per number of inputs. So what we're going to do, our running time, is we're going to express it as some function f of n. This n is going to be the input size. Okay? So it's going to be, um, and we're going to think about this as the representative Input size. Now, what do I mean by the representative for input size n? The point is that there could be lots of different inputs of a particular size. There could be lots of inputs of size 3, and it might be faster on some than the other. Again, we want to make things simpler. Instead of having a whole bunch of numbers, we want to shrink it down to one number per n, which will give us a function. That is our goal. So how would we do that? So what I'd like to do is trade in my cookies for some algorithms. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw 
little diagrams that have to do with the running time for one size of input. So here are th we're going to have four algorithms. Across all the bottoms, we're going to assume these are all the instances of size 3. Assume that I've written it for all of these as well. And in this way, we're going to look at time. Okay? And these are going to be our three choices, our four choices, A, B, C, and D. What we're trying to do is squeeze out some representative number that means something. So what could these numbers be? Let's give an example for A. Let's make life simple and say they're just four and they're all of this same size. And then we have B, which have some of this size, some bigger, and some smaller. For C, most are smaller. I'm comparing them to uh, uh, A again. One's way bigger. And then we have D, where most are really big, but what is small. So we want to be, have some way of comparing these algorithms. Now, one option would be to say, let's be really optimistic. Let's assume that we're going to always get the best of these, that our input is always going to be the smallest. So we would call that particular option the best case, the smallest one for all of them. And the problem here, of course, is that well, we seem to get uh, not a good indication. First of all, these two look the same, as Tahar's best case is concerned. And it looks, like, um, it looks like B is better than A, which it doesn't seem to be on average, whatever that means. Okay. Well, let's try something else that's simple. Suppose we looked at the worst case. We looked at the longest of these. And here what happens? Well, in the worst case, again, C and D look the same, but now A looks better than B. Do we like worst case better than best case? We're not really happy with either, right? I mean, there's something that seems to be lacking in both. It looks like what we'd like to have is some sort of an average case that gives a sense of everything that's going on. And it sounds like, well, if we had an average case, then we'd be able to compare these two nicely have a sense of them all. So those are our contenders. And I'm going to erase this picture. Our contenders are best, worst, and average. And it looks like this is the winner. But there's a problem. And the problem goes back in some sense, to doing more work than is needed. In order to really get a sense of what the average case is, we need to have a good probability distribution on these inputs. We don't know if they're all equally likely. And we might not have a good way of finding out the probability distribution. If we don't have a good distribution, then our numbers don't really mean anything. And often to get that distribution, we have to do more work than really is possible. So even though there are circumstances where people do look at average case, in general, they throw up their hands and say, I can't do that, but I can do worst case. And the beauty of worst case is you don't actually have to figure out what the worst case input looks like. You can say, well, it's not going to be any worse than this, and get a sense from there. And what's nice about that is at least you get a guarantee. So these two might look the same that, that way, which isn't great, but at least you know they're never going to be worse than what, what our, our indication is. Okay? So we are actually going to focus on worst case. All right. So now what do we do? Mm -hmm. Two minutes. OK, I will use my two minutes well. What we're going to do is we want to look at things in a general way. We don't look at a lot of detail. So what we'd like to be able to do is, if we view these as all possible functions, 
we want to group them into general categories. So the idea of asymptotic notation, which is today's topic, and clearly next lecture's topic as well, um, um, is a way of grouping these functions. And we use some notation. One is uh, we have something which is a big O. A big O is like an upper bound. And the way you can view that is the following way. If we say, well, if these are all our functions, and we draw a line here, and the small ones are down here and the big ones are up here, then if we have some function g of n, kind of, let's call it the big O of g of n, it's going to be everything that's here. It's, it's giving a bound on everything here. We're just talking about these in a general way. We also have something called big omega, which is like a lower bound, and it's going to be everything starting from this point and up. This is very vaguely described. We'll be looking at more accurate notation next time. And then we have something known as theta, which is sort of things that fall in between. That's very roughly how this applies. What I would like to do very quickly is draw a diagram where we look at um, a bunch of different categories. And I think what will be for us to think about for next time, <laughs> where we would say, what if we have uh, a bunch of different lines, like so? And if we know that two functions are both below this big line, do we know which one's better than the other? So we could draw one here. We could draw one here. Our rough notation is only going to say how they compare to something up here, but not to each other. So what we'll talk about next time is how, in fact, the um, notation has limitations on how it works. And we will also come back finally to this topic where there are situations where even though things might be in the same category, there are other things which are more important. I'll leave it there. Thank you.